This has been a, just an extraordinary event for me to participate in. And I, I have to say, I am so grateful to everyone that made it possible. And uh, thank you for all who were involved. I'm, uh, the, the conversations that I've had with my colleagues and, and the relationships and things, I think I, my intuition is that they're, they're going to have, uh, they'll be long term. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So I have so many things to say. <laughs> it's hard to know where to start, except that um, I would like to uh, suggest some different concepts and ideas. I'm an inventor in the US. I have a patent for differentiating one person's genome from the other and then mapping the genome using two or 3D coordinates. So if you have a, a genome browser with pan and zoom functionality and you want to add annotation to that and distribute that data, then that's kind of the technology, the mapping technology they're working on top of. We have not yet figured out how to, to deploy this technology in the US. There's, it's one thing to come up with a solution, the technical solution. It's another thing to figure out where in the world is the responsible location and the most likely location that, the, that there'll be a successful deployment. And I'm delighted to be here because I, I do think that Cambridge uh, stands a good chance of being that place in the globe where there's leadership and we see a, a responsible, sustainable deployment and very successful integration of personal genetic data with the web. So in 10 years' time, I'm anticipating perhaps as many as 2 billion genomes will merge with the internet. And in that process, the genome is a data file format. It's so powerful because you only need 200 values in a genome to uniquely identify one in a trillion human beings. So the genome as a data file format is going to transform the web into a biological network. And the implications for this are very profound. Your electronic health records, once they have a genetic data set, those entities are going to be able to reach in that genetic data set. Initially, they'll use it for performing audits of their systems. Eventually, the user account for the electronic health record will be derived from the values of that DNA. It's a reliable uh, way of reassociating the data with the individual throughout their lifetime. But there's huge privacy concerns. And so there's a need to position this transition and educate the public in a way that's acceptable. And I would advocate that we, we switch to a concept of biological domains, right? so that you're no longer a user account under a domain that's owned by someone else. You have a domain in your own right, right? And you pick a trusted register for that domain and the part of your health record that is portable, you have the ability to move that information as you see fit. And suddenly, you have a universal health record based on real-time patient consent with them able to manage access to sub-segments of their genome along with any other biological information they wish to share. So what this enables is what I, I like to think of as self-organizing genomes with real-time consent. You have the ability for patients to begin to uh, self-organize, to work directly with those researchers. And then immediately people start throwing up their arms and like, but what about patient safety and how do we control this information access and things? It's, it's, uh, technically, it's very easy. Okay? Whether or not there's the political leadership is, is another matter. But what you do is, is uh, genetic information is location-based information. I'll demo uh, um, a simple Google Earth for the cell to show how this platform can be used. But what you do is you, you have the raw data stored separately. You map the interpretation with a rating for quality of science. That's like an A through F, right? Medical utility, you know, five stars, you know. And then viewing risk. And that's how much guidance, and, you know, the counselor and the like, based on accessing interpretation. And that way, a patient will be, able to, will be able to trigger the proper level of guidance the moment they go to access any part of their genome. And most likely, that'll be a video that'll say, oh, by the way, here's the factors and the context and, and that sort of thing. This is very easy technically to implement. It's impossible to deploy it in the US. As soon as one group seems to make progress in this area, then the other groups that are worried about how this is going to impact their business model uh, put up barriers and, and kind of, and anyway, they make it quite difficult to deploy. So, um, uh, so there's a huge uh, education issue with disseminating genetic information. There's a big consent issue, but there's also, this has to be easy for the physician. It, need, it can't need to add to their cost and their workload. So what I, I'm showing here is just a very simple, and I, I know this, it's a, I want to apologize, it's a very crude map of the genome, but we've just simply taken the chromosomes that could from mom, be from mom on the left, dad on the right. We have chromosome one on the bottom, 22 at the top. 
And the way we see it working is when the user submits a DNA sample, they receive a site login, and, and then they begin to manage access to their genome based on real-time consent. But the, the physician could simply type in a keyword, and immediately, you know, you could see uh, the genetic markers that were related to it, source, you know, sort it based on its uh, clinical significance, and, and be able to zoom in to different layers of detail. And I will, you know, I don't, I'm not saying we have this right, but we're, we're trying to change these genome browsers so that you use simple symbology. And the goal is to give physicians and patients a sense of mastery and control over these data sets. And we quit thinking about open data and we start thinking about consented data because we know once people have the ability to control who they share their information with, historically they've been extremely generous in how they share that information. And then I wanted to quickly show here, um, this is an example of a thematic map and, and, and I, you know, this is a, a gross oversimplification of the data, but this could be a, a diagnostic for breast cancer. P a patient comes in, they say, well, I think I might have a lump, and, and, and simply you get a very nonverbal, immediate read of what's the relative risk based on how large, the, how red the death dots are with the ability to uh, touch on them and then immediately uh, dive down and access a more detailed uh, level of information. <laughs> so, um, what I am hoping for is that the UK would lead the way. You have a very successful deployment of universal health records. You have a patient that's less at risk than many of the other patients around the globe. You have the leading researchers worldwide. And the country that has the courage to move forward with this type of a model, all the researchers around the globe are going to flock to that country. They'll have the critical mass of genomes. They'll have the critical mass of patient phenotype data. And also, we know over time, uh, you know, a lot of these diseases are going to be tied to much more so uh, environmental conditions. And so we'll fairly quickly be able to eliminate the genetic variable in the study of the disease and understand what our priorities are for cleaning up the environment. And the idea is um, to start now with some sort of a mechanism to facilitate the information flow. And like I say, it's been delightful to be here and have a chance to uh, explain this vision. So thank you. <laughs>